Welcome to Face Towards Zion. The Come Follow Me curricula for July 27th through August 9th covers Alma chapters 39 through 52. I had a vacation last week and wasn't able to post any videos. I will again cover two lessons in this video focusing on the Great Plan of Happiness. For this week's cover, I selected a diagram of the plan of salvation. This is a pretty common rendition of this plan. This version shows the different times of resurrection. Alma will discuss this in this week's lesson. Similar to the previous few lessons, it, it would not be smart to combine two lessons into one. However, due to time, I'm going to do that again. The lesson material for chapters 39 to 42 is Alma's discourse to his wayward son Corianton and is focused on the plan of redemption. In Alma chapter 43, the wars begin and seem to go on and on. We will finish them next week. For chapter titles, I gave chapter 39 the means title of Alma to, to Corianton or Cross Yourself. Chapter 40, it's the resurrection or Corianton's questions answered. Alma chapter 41, the plan of restoration or natural consequences. Alma chapter 42, Alma to Corianton, the conclusion or the demands of justice and the plan of mercy. Alma chapter 43, the wars begin or when is it okay to go to war? Alma chapter 44, the end of Alma's record or surrender my way or the highway. Alma chapter 45, Helaman leads the church or commitment and prophecy. Alma chapter 46, the title of liberty or on covenants. Chapter 47, through cunning, Malachiah becomes king of the Lamanites or sometimes wickedness pays off in the short term. Alma chapter 48, preparations during peacetime or on war and peace. Alma chapter 49, be prepared or righteousness leads to victory. Alma chapter 50 is Tiankum and Morianton, or the foundations of happiness. Alma chapter 51, the freemen versus the kingmen, or first cleanse the inner vessel. And finally, Alma chapter 52 is the city of Mulek retaken, or tactical warfare. In the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, our present day chapters 39 through 42 are all included in chapter 19. It's really one story. The story begins by Alma chastising Corianton for chasing after the harlot Isabel. There are only three New World women mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Lehi's wife Sariah, Abish, the Lamanite servant who hearkened everyone to see the king and queen who had collapsed, and finally the harlot Isabel, an interesting choice of women. Also there are three historical women mentioned, Eve, the Virgin Mary, and Abraham's wife Sarah. While Corianton made bad choices, it seems he didn't have a good understanding of the gospel and particularly the plan of salvation. Interestingly, when you put on the armor of God, you have your loins girt about with truth. This means that when you know the truth of who you are, then you are not willing to give up your chastity. Knowing the truth will protect you. It seems that Corianton doesn't understand the plan of salvation. Alma will spend some time teaching him about the resurrection and the plan of redemption. Verse 13 is an interesting verse. That ye turn to the Lord with your mind, might, and strength. That ye lead away the hearts of no more to do wickedly, but rather return unto them and acknowledge your faults and that wrong which ye have done. This verse is interesting for a number of reasons. I like the usage of mind, might, and strength. Watch how many times these words are used together. Other places in scripture, the words will change a little bit, but the idea is the same. These all go back to the Shema, which was recited in Jewish homes in the morning and evening services. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Verse 13 is interesting for at least one other reason. The end of the verse originally was worded, and acknowledge your faults and repair that wrong which ye have done. But Oliver Cowdery, when he finished completing this page in the original manuscript, accidentally dropped some ink on the page. The ink was on the word repair and made the P look like a T. Also, 
all of her R's would also look like N's. So when Oliver copied this to the printer's manuscript, he copied it over as retain. So the 1830 edition says, and acknowledge your faults and retain that wrong which ye have done. In the 1920 edition of the Book of Mormon, the scripture committee decided to remove the word retain as it doesn't make sense. So that verbiage has stayed with us. But we should repair the wrong which ye have done. In verse 17, Alma tells of the first big question that Corianton has. And now I will ease your mind somewhat on this subject. Behold, you marvel why these things should be known so long beforehand. Behold, I say unto you, is not a soul at this time as precious unto, unto God as a soul will be at the time of his coming? Have you ever wondered why you were born when and where you were? What would it have been like to have lived in the time of the Savior? Alma teaches that all God's children are important to him, regardless of when or where they were born. Alma then gets to heavy, important issues for a Korean and really for all of us. Now, my son, here is somewhat more I would say unto thee, for I perceive that thy mind is worried concerning the resurrection of the dead. It doesn't appear that Corianton didn't believe in a resurrection. It was more the timing of it. If you put yourself in Corianton's shoes, the initial resurrection of the time of Christ hadn't happened yet. It may have felt that it would never happen, so why worry about it? Alma's advice was more that it will happen and just be patient. When you look at other religions, even Christian religions, there is a lot of discrepancy over this very question. Many Orthodox Protestant religions take the stance that when we die, we really die. We cease to exist for a time. The miracle of the resurrection is that we now come back to life in a spiritual body. If you believe that God is only a spirit and doesn't have a body, then it makes sense that you would not be resurrected with a physical body either. So the miracle of resurrection is that you go from a state of non-existence back into a spiritual being and become one with God without body, parts, or passions, and then worship God forever. Sometimes I think that if I were not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I would struggle to be a Christian. That belief that some Christians have doesn't make sense to me. It's also just as hard if you're a Catholic. Basically, they believe that you go to either heaven, purgatory, or hell. Generally, heaven is for only the super righteous and only a few make it to this state of happiness. Most will end up in purgatory where you basically suffer for eons until the resurrection and most don't even make it to that nice of a place. For those who have rejected God, they will spend eternity in hell. Really pretty difficult alternatives. Alma explains to Corianton what really happens. Verses 11 through 13. Now, Concerning the state of the soul between death and the resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they are departed from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God who gave them life. And then shall it come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace where they shall rest from all their troubles and from all care and sorrow. And then shall it come to pass that the spirits of the wicked, yea, who are evil, for behold, they have no part nor portion of the Spirit of the Lord, for behold, they chose evil works rather than good. Therefore the spirit of the devil did enter into them and take possession of their house, and these shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and this because of their own iniquity, being led captive by the will of the devil. So there is a mini judgment and the righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise. But the wicked do suffer for their sins. Alma does talk about the different resurrections. If you look at the graphic that I had on the cover of this video and showing here, you can see the different resurrections. This graphic is very similar to others. One thing that is a little confusing to me is the role of the judgment and the resurrection. Many Ill illustrations have the judgment as last. In reality, there are multiple judgments. There is a judgment at death that determines if we go to paradise or spirit prison. Also, 
I struggle if the final judgment comes after the resurrection. If you are resurrected with a glorified body, I don't think you will be judged to go into the celestial kingdom. I think the judgment and resurrection occurs pretty much at the same time, and then the body you are raised with automatically goes to the correct kingdom. I believe that as for the resurrection, that resurrection is now final. If you are raised with a celestial body, I don't think you will ever have it changed to become celestial. Now we know that the celestial kingdom has different kingdoms within it. You can probably advance within that kingdom, or your kingdom can continue to grow. Alan's point seems to be that the resurrection is part of a restoration. This world is a short temporal world where we learn and grow. Ultimately, everything will be restored to its proper place. Chapter 41, verses 2 and 3. I say unto thee, my son, that the plan of restoration is requisite with the justice of God, for it is requisite that all things should be restored to their proper order. Behold, it is requisite and just, according to the power and resurrection of Christ, that the soul of man should be restored to its body, and that every part of the body should be restored to itself. And it is requisite with the justice of God that men should be judged according to their works. And if their works were good in this life, and the desires of their heart were good, that they should also at the last day be restored unto that which is good. Do you notice how these things are requisite with the justice of God? That phrase is used at the beginning of both verses 2 and 3. God does not send us to earth to fail. Yes, we all make mistakes, but our mistakes help us to learn and turn to God. He is not going to leave us here to fail. His justice requires that all things be restored to their proper order. The key for us is what is our order. Is it our order to do well, to try to do our best, to try to learn and try to repent? Or are we generally haughty? Do we really not care? These attitudes and ultimately this person we have become will be restored, good for good, evil for evil. Notice in verse 3 the relationship between our works and the desires of our hearts. We will be judged according to our works and the desires of our hearts. Can it happen that our works are good but that our desires of our hearts are bad? We can definitely do the right thing for the wrong reason, and I believe we can also do the wrong thing for the right reason. I have heard it said that the only way we can build up Zion is when we do the right thing for the right reason. Then true power can occur. Let our hearts be good and then let our actions follow our hearts. Let's do good because that is who we are and because it's the right thing to do. As Alma continues to counsel his son, his words become poetic. Verses 13 through 15 can be formatted as shown here. Note the incredible chiastic structure. The message seems to be in the middle. Be merciful to your brethren. Deal justly. Judge righteously and do good continually. Isn't the gospel pretty much summarized right there in those points? I've heard that Lowell Benyon's favorite scripture is in Micah chapter 6 verse 8. He has shewed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. All of this seems to be Alma setting us up for an incredible conclusion. He is now going to wrap it all up. And what is the conclusion of all of Alma's words? An explanation of the atonement. I did a video over Easter talking about the infinite atonement. Much of that material is here in Alma chapter 42. Alma begins by tying the atonement to the fall of Adam. Alma chapter 42 verse 2. Now behold, my son, I will explain this thing unto thee. For behold, after the Lord God sent our first parents forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence they were taken, yea, he drew out the man, and he placed at the east end of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the tree of life. This says he drew out the man. If you compare the original manuscript with the printer's manuscript, the original manuscript says, yea, he drove out the man. Here, drove is probably a stronger word than drew, 
Still, the meaning comes back to the fall. I like how this verse says the flaming sword turned every way. What do you mean it turned every way? I think that is a reference to a fourth dimension. Again, see my video on infinite atonement where I talk about the different dimensions. Alma is the prototype. Adam fell, but Adam is a prototype of each of us. Each one of us fell from our pre-mortal life to this world, and we shouted for joy to have this opportunity. And in this life, we have our agency. That is the next verse. Now, we see that the man had become as God, knowing good and evil. And of course, by knowing evil, we sometimes choose evil. We make mistakes. Remember, this is Alma talking to his son Corianton, who had just made a big mistake. Alma is using all the love he can to explain this to his son. The entire chapter is beautiful. Verse 14. And thus we see that all mankind were fallen, and they were in the grasp of justice, yea, the justice of God, which consigned them forever to be cut off from his presence. So because of our actions, we are sunk. We're through. And then Alma explains. And now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. Therefore God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy to appease the demands of justice that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. No Alma's words. They are important here. The plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. This plan of mercy is here to appease the demands of justice. Note that this verse does not say the law of mercy will overcome the law of justice. No, the, there are no eternal laws of justice and mercy. It is God's plan of mercy to overcome the demands of justice. But what are the demands of justice? Fortunately, Alma tells us in verse 18, Now there was a punishment affixed and a just law given, which brought remorse of conscience unto man. God's demands of justice require there to be a punishment when a law is broken. And what is that punishment? If you commit sin X, then can you suffer punishment Y and all is now fixed? Is this punishment doing time in jail or even being locked in the stocks for a certain amount of time? According to the Book of Mormon, according to Alma, what is the punishment for a broken law? It is the remorse of conscience. Let me read that verse one more time. Now there was a punishment affixed and a just law given, which brought remorse of conscience unto man. The remorse of conscience. What is that? Sadly, I don't have to define that because we all know what it is. Every one of us has felt it. You know exactly what it is. I know exactly what it is. And interestingly, this is what we are all fighting about. Many people don't like how this feels and so they want to change the rules. They want to act a certain way without feeling the remorse of conscience. The only way to do this is to change the law, or as verse 18 says, the just law given. There is a just law that brings the remorse of conscience. So if you want to still do the action and not feel bad, what do you do? The only thing you can do is change the law. You justify it. You say that it is a natural thing and it's not wrong, and so you start a movement of others who feel the same way. If you can get enough, then you can start to make legislation and you can justify your actions. But even with all the support, all the legislation, guess what? We skip this from verse from chapter 41. Do not suppose, because it has been spoken concerning restoration, that ye shall be restored from sin to happiness. Behold, I say unto you, Wickedness never was happiness. Wickedness never was happiness. You can legislate all you want and you can have all the movements that you want, but you know what? Wickedness never was happiness. And you can take that phrase to the bank. The outcome of all the movements in the world will not matter if they are trying to legislate wickedness. God's law is God's law is God's law. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Alma is talking to his son Corianton that just violated the law of chastity. He is saying there is a way back. That way is called repentance. 
Because of God's plan of mercy, we can be forgiven and the remorse of conscience that can happen can be overcome. And that only way is through repentance. Justifying it doesn't work. Legislating against it doesn't work. Creating a movement against it doesn't work. Only repentance. And what does God require of us? He told us earlier, be merciful to your brethren, deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. That is what you do. But there is a law given and a punishment affixed and a repentance granted, which repentance mercy claimeth. Otherwise, justice claimeth the creature and executeth the law, and the law inflicteth the punishment. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed and God would cease to be God. But God ceaseth not to be God, and mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement. And the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead bringeth back men, bringeth back men into the presence of God. And thus they are restored into his presence, to be judged according to their works, according to the law and justice. And the last words we have from the incredible prophet Alma is, O my son, I desire that you should deny the justice of God no more. Do not endeavor to excuse yourself in the least point because of your sins by denying the justice of God. But do let the justice of God and his mercy and his long suffering have full sway in your heart and let it bring you down to the dust in humility. And now, O my son, ye are called of God to preach the word unto his people. And now, my son, go thy way. Declare the word with truth and soberness, that thou mayest bring souls unto repentance, that the great plan of mercy may have claim upon them, and may God grant you even according to my words. Amen. And with chapter 43, we now begin the war chapters. There's been quite a bit said about these chapters, because sadly it is a lot of men to have to fight wars. Mormon who abridged this part in most of the Book of Mormon was a general and familiar to war. I think he included these chapters to show that sometimes we really don't have a choice. I titled chapter 43, When is it okay to go to war? This is a tough question. We have been blessed with not having major wars for the last number of years. The scriptures also talk that as the final hardships come upon us, if we are righteous, the Lord will fight our battles for us. But in the annals of time, when is it okay to go to war? The Book of Mormon is formatted different than we would format articles today. When using lists, they would use the word and. Today, we would put them into bullets or lists. Let's read Alma chapter 43 verse 9 with numbered lists. And now the design of the Nephites was to support one their lands and two their houses and three their wives and four their children, that they might one preserve them from the hands of their enemies, and also that they might two, preserve their rights, and three, their privileges, yea, and four, also their liberty, that they might five, worship God according to their desires. This verse gives two bulletized lists, the first showing what they were trying to protect, the second their rights. This bulletized list is given in other places in chapter 43. See verse 45. Nevertheless, the Nephites were inspired by a better cause, for they were not fighting for monarchy nor power, but they were fighting for, one, their homes, and two, their liberties, three, their wives, and four, their children, and five, their all, yea, for six, their rights of worship, and seven, their church. Compare these lists and see how similar they are. They include their homes, their houses their wives, their children, their liberties, and their rights for worship. You can see how important something is by how often it is repeated. I just showed you two similar lists. There are more. Verse 47. And again the Lord has said that ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. Therefore for this cause were the Nephites contending with the Lamanites to defend one themselves and two their families and three their lands four their country, and five their rights, and six their religion. Here you may notice that I put the phrase, ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed in quotes. Mormon is quoting this phrase from somewhere else, a source we don't currently have. Even in the next verse, 
verse 48, Moroni will use the words, their lands, their liberty, yea, their freedom from bondage. One final example, and we will summarize. Alma 44, verse 5. And now Zarahemna, I command you in the name of all that all-powerful God who has strengthened our arms, that we have gained power over you by one, our faith, by two, our religion, and by three, our rights of worship, and by four, our church, and by five, the sacred support which we owe to six, our wives, and seven, our children, eight, that by liberty which binds us to our nine lands and ten our country yea also by eleven the maintenance of the sacred word of god to which we owe all our happiness and twelve by all that is most dear unto us do you notice the similarity of all these lists centuries later long after the nephite nation had ceased to exist another nation was struggling to be born 1776 had been a difficult year Though highlighted by the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the American army was not faring very well on the battlefield. Defeat after defeat left Washington's army to the point of breathing its last breath. In a stroke of desperation on Christmas Day, 1776, George Washington crossed the Delaware and attacked the professional British and Hessian forces. The ensuing Battle of Trenton was a turning point in the war. The surprise victories gave America life. However, the contracts of those soldiers were coming to a close. They had enlisted for only a short term, and they could now return home with their heads held high. But George Washington still needed them. The new country really couldn't afford to even pay them. As told in the book The Washington Hypothesis by Timothy Ballard, he said, With Congress helpless to respond, Washington did the only thing he could do. He gathered his troops. The drum roll began and the general asked all of those willing to extend their tours to step forward. Not a soul budged. A depressed Washington turned his horse and began riding away. Then suddenly he stopped, returned to his men, and said, My brave fellows, you have done all I have asked you to do, and more than could be reasonably expected. But your country is at stake, your wives, your house, and all you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with fatigues and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. If you will continue to stay one month longer, you will render that service to the cause of liberty and to your country, which you can probably never do under any other circumstance. In this time of despair, Washington invoked a special cause, the cause of one, your country, two, your wives, three, your house, and four, all you hold dear. He even asked to render service to the cause of liberty. It is interesting how closely Moroni would come to these same words. And now it came to pass when Moroni, who was the chief commander of the armies of the Nephites, had heard of these dissensions, he was angry with Amalickiah. And it came to pass that he rent his coat, and he took a piece thereof and wrote upon it, In memory of our God, our religion and freedom, and our peace, our wives and our children, and he fastened it upon the end of a pole. These words would become a rallying cry for the Nephites. It would take a few more years and a number of battles until the Nephites would prevail, but the lessons are very clear. We need to be willing to give all we have for our God, our religion, our freedom, our peace, our wives and our children. We need to be faithful today more than any other time in history. I'd like to close with a quote from General Conference. The quote I chose this week is from Ezra Taft Benson from the October 1966 conference. The problem with this is the Gospel Library only goes back to 1971 and I can't find any audio for this speech. So I will just read what he said. I'll begin a little before what I have on the screen. He said, Of course the war in heaven over free agency is now being waged here on earth. And there are those today who are saying, look, don't get involved in the fight for freedom, just live the gospel. That course is dangerous, self-contradictory, unsound. The Book of Mormon pays tribute to General Moroni in these words. And Moroni was a strong and a mighty man. He was a man of perfect understanding, yea, a man that did not delight in bloodshed, a man whose soul did joy in the liberty and the freedom of his country and his brethren from bondage and slavery. 
yea he was a man who was firm in the faith of christ and he had sworn with an oath to defend his people his rights and his country and his religion even to the loss of his blood and then moroni is paid this high tribute yea verily verily i say unto you if all men had been and were and ever would be like unto moroni behold the very powers of hell would have been shaken for ever yea the devil would never have ha have power over the hearts of the children of men now part of the reason we may not have sufficient priesthood bearers to save the constitution let alone to shake the powers of hell is because unlike moroni i fear our souls do not joy in keeping our country free we are not firm in the faith of christ nor have we sworn with an oath to defend our rights and the liberty of our country. Moroni raised the title of liberty and wrote upon it these words, In memory of our God, our religion, and freedom, and our peace, our wives, and our children. Why didn't he write upon it, Just live your religion. There's no need to concern yourselves about your freedom, your peace, your wives, or your children. The reason he didn't do this was because all these things were a part of his religion, as they are of our religion today. Should we counsel people just live your religion? There's no need to get involved in the fight for freedom. No, we should not, because our stand for freedom is a most basic part of our religion. This stand helped us to get to this earth, and our reaction to freedom in this life will have eternal consequences. Man has many duties, but he has no excuse that can compensate for his loss of liberty. As members of the church, we have some close quarters to pass through if we are going to get home safely. We will be given a chance to choose between conflicting counsel given by some. That's why we must learn, and the sooner we learn the better, to keep our eye on the prophet, the president of the church.